Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo brokerage account. They're going to give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app, guys. When you put $100 in your new Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks, guys. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo link. Open up that new Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Don't delay. Act today. It's critical, guys, that we put ourselves in a position where we're ready to build wealth. No better time than right now over these next 10 years to build wealth for you and your family. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to pass on some financial wealth to somebody down the line, whether it be your kids, charitable organization, family members, you name it. If you have wealth, guys, you can pass it down. We got to start creating some generational wealth. We've not created any in a long time, guys. Matter of fact, we've never created any. We got to start creating some generational wealth and it starts with you. But you got to execute. You got to take yourself off the sideline and put yourself in the game. That brokerage account from Moomoo will help you do that. So if you want to get started today, go down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link and let's get going. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you two videos. Two videos. The first one is going to be my wealth transfer blueprint, where it outlines my three big boy blue chip paper assets that I'm buying in 24 and beyond to double my net worth in the next 10 years. I'll send you that video. It'll tell you exactly what I'm buying. Now, you can copy my plan or you can create your own plan, but at least you know what this guy on YouTube who has 25 years worth of experience building wealth on his own, self-directed, you'll know what I'm doing. The next video I'm gonna send you is a Moo Moo tutorial video. Guys, I'm trying to help you collapse time frames. I'm trying to get you off to a good start. That's the reason I did the Moo Moo tutorial. I'm not an expert on the Moo Moo app. I'm just a guy who uses the Moo Moo app so I know how to operate the basic functions of it. Moo Moo app itself is the expert because it has in-app tutorials. But my video that I did, it's going to collapse time frames for you and get you straight to the point where you can get on there and start building wealth, buying paper assets. So if you want those two videos, email address down in the description box. Send me an email. Richard, open my Moo Moo account. I'm ready to get started to building wealth ASAP. Send me those two videos. Your wealth transfer blueprint and the Moomoo tutorial, and boom, just like that, it's on its way to you. I answer all my emails, guys. You guys know if you've emailed me, I've responded. I respond to all of my emails. That's the best way you can contact me. The second best way you can contact me is follow me on Instagram at Richard Fain Millionaire Mentor. You can send me a DM there too. Now, let me tell you, go down to the description box and click on that Instagram link. That's the only way you're going to find me, guys. Don't go on Instagram trying to search for me because you probably come across a scammer. A lot of scammers on Instagram. So if you know, if you really want to know you got me on Instagram, go down to the description box. My Instagram is in the description box of any of my videos or my recent videos. Any of my recent videos from 2024. My Instagram link is in there. So if you want to follow me on, on IG, you want to also email me, you got both options. I'll send you those two videos, all right? Well, guys, we got a lot to cover. So before we do, one more house cleaning uh, item. 
Lock it in with a thumbs up. We got a few people in here already. We ain't been in here but about five minutes. We got a few people in here. So lock it in with a thumbs up, guys, if you don't mind. If you appreciate the content, it really helps a lot when you hit the thumbs up button. That just lets me know I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, 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 I'm discussing the information that you guys want to hear when it comes to our economy, when it comes to interest rates, when it comes to the stock market, crypto market, real estate, businesses, I talk about all that stuff, guys, every day, 1030 a.m. Eastern time on this channel through my live streams. And then that live stream turns into a video just in case you miss one. So if you rock with me, lock it in with a thumbs up to let me know you rock with me and that I'm, 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 I'm giving you the information that will help you build wealth and pass on generational wealth to your family and to, your, to whoever you want to pass it on to. But we do got a lot to cover and we're going to talk about the U.S. dollar. We're going to also talk about the U.S. debt. Uh, the U.S. dollar is under pressure, guys. It's under tremendous pressure from a lot of outside influences. And, and if these people have their way, they're going to collapse the U.S. dollar. We're going to talk about some of the things that the United States has recognized that this threat is out there. We're going to talk about that threat we're also going to talk about this, this escalating national debt that we have, guys. It's, it's out of control. Over the last 20 days, when I, when, I, when I walk you guys through what we've done over the last 20 days as it relates to escalating our, our, our national debt, your jaw going to drop. It's, it's, a, it's, it's crazy that we're continuing to build up this, 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 this debt here in the United States that at some point, it may come back to bite us. So we're going to talk about that as well. We're going to also talk about some of these, these too big to fail banks, man, who are being sued. Um, it's some shady stuff going on, man, with some of these big boy banks. I mean, these guys are so greedy, man. I mean, you're already making trillions of dollars and you're still greedy. I just don't get it. But we're going to talk about some of these big boy banks got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Yep, they got caught with the hand in the cookie jar, trying to take more than one cookie. They got caught. So we're going to talk about them. And then obviously we're going to talk about your daily dose. We're going to give you your daily dose of crypto. I, I, listen, guys, I got to give you your daily dose of crypto. Right? I'm going to give you the bad and I'm going to give you the good. Today, you're going to get some good on crypto. So stick around for some of you crypto guys. You're going to get some good information on crypto today. So I, I know I always talk bad about crypto. Today, we're going to share a little bit of good news about crypto, but it's only a little bit, it, only a little bit of good news. It's not a lot of good news, just a little bit. So a little bit of crypto, a little daily dose of crypto. But let's start off with the U.S. dollar. Let's start there. And then we will then talk a little bit about the, the U.S. debt. Amid the, oh, let me, here's the headline. Here's the headline. Here's the headline. U.S. monitoring BRICS digital currency push amid dollar decline. That's the headline, guys. Now you got the United States government monitoring this thing because these, these folks at BRICS ain't messing around. And for those of y'all don't know what BRICS is, go out to the $1 trillion research lab and type that into the search bar, BRICS. And you can read all about BRICS. I've covered BRICS in depth on, on, on prior videos, so I'm not going to dive too much into BRICS. But BRICS is, is, is starting to escalate their game. They're starting to escalate their attack on the U.S. dollar. And the United States has recognized that. So let's, let's read on. Amid the ongoing development for the alliance during a U.S. election year, Weiser is monitoring BRICS digital currency push amid its ongoing dollar decline. Indeed, the Financial Times reported the concern that the United States has held regarding Russia's continued foray into the sector. Russia has recently signed legislation that will increase its digital asset usage. Moreover, the BRICS Economic Alliance is currently developing a blockchain based payment system to support its native currency. 
According to reports, the West is observing the potential negative uses of this ongoing commitment and research. U.S. reportedly monitoring BRICS digital currency focus throughout the last year, the BRICS Economic Alliance has firmly embraced de-dollarization efforts. Now, here's the deal, guys. BRICS, this is a group of countries who have said, you know something? We're tired of the United States dominance. We're tired of these guys. We are sick and tired of the United States dominating the financial markets. We are sick and tired of the U.S. dollar being the world's reserve currency. What does that mean? That means every country out there, any country that's a little shaky, a little wobbly, you know, currency go up and down, a lot of crooks, a lot of government manipulation. A lot of those countries transact business in the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. It's stable. What I don't want to have happen if I'm living in some little country and I make a you know, I make a purchase or a trade from some other little country. And by the time it, the dust settles, their little currency done been dethroned and their currency is no good. I don't get paid. So a lot of these countries know that. So what do they do? They make other countries pay them in the U.S. dollar because why? We're the number one power. And we're the number one financial system in the world. We are who everybody settles their transactions in U.S. dollars because of that reason. They can depend on the dollar. A lot of countries out there don't like that. And these, these, these BRICS alliance. And let me tell you who the countries are. It's Brazil. It's Russia. Brazil. Russia. They don't like us. They don't like us. South Africa, mm -mm. don't like us. Some of these countries do not like us. So led by Russia, right? Russia is the one behind all of this. They're developing their own currency so that they can take out the U.S. dollar. They're going to have, they're going to, they're using a, 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 a blockchain based payment system now the thing is guys russia ain't no slouch y'all know russia a big boy russia is a big boy they are a big boy and they're starting to gain some traction like i said you got you got you got brazil you got russia you got india you got china another big boy Big boy, second largest economy in the world is China behind the United States. And then you got South Africa. Those are your five BRICS countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now they're putting together all these other countries. I think they're starting to get this thing up, man. I, I know they made a pitch to like 159 other countries. And what they're trying to do, guys, is this. They're trying to destroy the United States because they know if they can, they can devalue the dollar, what does that do to the United States? It devalues us. We're no, no longer the world's reserve currency. If they can take that from us, they can slowly start trying to just collapse the dollar. And if our dollar is worth half, you know, if our dollar is, is, is devalued by 50 percent, that impacts us. It impacts me as an investor because all of my assets are in U.S. dollar. All of my assets are in U.S. companies. All of my assets are in U.S. real estate. And all of that is dependent on us having a strong dollar, guys. You know, if the dollar is devalued by 50%, your assets are going to be devalued by 75%. Just telling you. And I'm telling you who's behind it. I'm telling you, Russia has only increased its commitment to digital development over the last several months. How, moreover, the United States has been consistently hesitant to integrate government issued digital assets into its economy. In the ongoing monitoring, they now have their eyes fixed on BRICS development in the sector. The action 
is all the more interesting considering the rather vulnerable state of the U.S. dollar currently. Both the blockchain-based payment system and the BRICS alternative currency will expand the alliance. De-dollarization efforts. Those are seemingly sought to be curtailed through ongoing action in defiance of the digital currency path. These guys ain't messing around, guys. These folks are not messing around. You got to understand, if you're supporting this type of thing, guys, and you live in the United States, you got to rethink that. I get it. I know all y'all, oh, we want decentralization. We want a digital currency. The dollar is useless. It's not going to be any good anymore. Guys, let me tell you, our whole country is based on the dollar. You devalue that. You devalue your country. You're going to devalue all your assets, especially if they're in the United States. All your real estate, all of your paper assets. Why? Because your paper assets are tied into who? Companies. You devalue the dollar, you devalue your great companies. You, you devalue your great companies. And if you devalue your great countries, I mean companies, your assets are no good if they're paper assets. I can tell you that right now, they're zero. Real estate. You devalue it. You devalue businesses. Anything that has to do with the U.S. economy, you devalue it if you support this, this whole notion of the dollar is no good anymore. We did Everything needs to be digital currency. It needs to be de uh, deregulated. But there shouldn't be any government oversight over anything. Guys, we already know what happens when you don't have any government oversight. Now, I'm not some guy sitting up here trying to be pro-government. Hey, government, take over everything. I ain't that guy. But let's be honest, guys. You know we got greedy in this world. You know the 1% greedy. You know if we ain't got no oversight, what they gonna do to the 99%. Before all we know, we'll be in chains. I'm trying to tell you guys, they will put us in chains. Physical chains. You better have somebody overlooking these people because if you don't, ain't no stopping them. They will, they will put us in chains, man. You ever seen that movie, Planet of the Apes? You, you seen that movie? What, 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 what the apes, they controlled everything and they had all the human beings in chains. Yeah, that, that's what'll happen. That's my opinion. You ain't got to believe it. You, you, you come up with your own conclusion. But I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. If you don't have some type of regulation, guys, you got to have something. You, it, it, everything can't just be the wild, wild west. Oh, we don't need no regulations. Just, you know, if somebody just come knock on my door, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, beat them up. I don't need no regulations. I don't need no, I don't need police. We don't need police. That's what you're saying. If you're saying we don't need no regulations for nothing in this world, guys, then we don't need police. Mm -mm. Just let people run around and do whatever they want to do. I don't know. Well, why would we need police? If we want to, we, 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 we want to decentralize everything. See, it don't make any sense when you really think about it. We need police. Yes, we need police. They, 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 they serve a vital function. We need police to keep order so that people, you know good and well when people back against that wall, man, they do things that they normally wouldn't do, guys. Y'all know how we are as human beings. We just like any other creature on this planet. You back any creature on this planet into a corner and they have no opportunity other than to fight and, and, and that worst side of them comes out, that's what happens to us as human beings too. That's exactly what's going to happen. You got to have some law and order, guys. Even in the financial world, we need some law and order in the financial world. Or the 1% will have us in financial chains. Just telling you, this is what's getting ready to happen with these guys over here at BRICS. See, they're, 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 my opinion, they're jealous of the United States. Why? Because we're the 900-pound gorilla. Right? We're, the most, we're the most valued country in the world. Everybody looks to the U.S. for financial guidance. They don't like that the United States come to the aid of different little countries and things like that. When big boy countries trying to fight them and beat them down to the dirt, the United States step in sometimes. And I'm not saying we step into stuff we should step into, but we do. Some of these countries don't like that. Some of these big boy countries don't like that. They want to be able to go and hit people over the head and just do whatever they want to do in the, in the world and nobody hold them accountable. 
But the United States will sometimes come in and try to hold people accountable. We're not perfect. Sometimes we do things we shouldn't do here in the U.S. We ain't, you know, we ain't, we ain't perfect. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is these folks here in this BRICS thing, in my opinion, they're trying to tear the United States in half, boy. Because they know if they can get our dollar to be devalued far enough, they got us. They got us. We're all as good as the dollar. They got us. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is, is pay attention to what's going on out here. Pay attention to what these guys over here at Brick. Now they can call it whatever they want to call it. All this, oh, we just want to, we, want, we don't want to be westernized. We just want to create our own payment. Ain't nobody stopping you from creating your own currency. Y'all already got your own currency. All these countries I just mentioned in the BRICS, all of them got their own currency, guys. They don't all use the U. They got their own currency. The problem is their currency raggedy. Their currency is raggedy. Look at Brazil. Raggedy. Raggedy. Brazil's currency is raggedy, man. They know that. And you look at the other four countries, they got their own currency. But now they, they, they just want to, they want to band together. Or everybody want to band together and just dethrone the United States. Not everybody. Now, nah. everybody ain't against us. We still got allies on the financial side. We still got allies on the financial side. But I'm telling you guys, these BRICS guys, it's gaining, popu it's gaining popularity. More and more countries are starting to get on the bandwagon. So all I'm telling you is, as a United States citizen or someone that lives in the United States and makes their living here, you better be careful what's going on around you. These people devalue the dollar. We're going to be in some, some hot water here. We're going to be in trouble. We are going to be in trouble if these people continue to, 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 to do what they're doing to devalue the dollar. Just, just know that. Just be on the lookout for that. Listen, I don't have a problem with, with people wanting to have, you know, some type of digital currency and, and there, be able to transact business with it. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem when you say we want a digital currency that just takes over the world and the dollar no longer exists. I got a problem with that. Because all of my assets are in U.S. dollars. All of my assets are based on U.S. dollars. See, my assets aren't based on some digital currency, some make-believe digital currency. All of mine is based on U.S. dollars. So you take that away from me, I got nothing. My net worth goes to zero. It goes to zero. Your net worth goes to zero. Say whatever you want to say. Your net worth goes to zero. All that little Social Security a lot, a lot, a lot of y'all getting, zero. They don't want Social Security. Matter of fact, ain't no more United States, really. You take away the dollar. Right? Now, I know what a lot of people are saying, well, I, we ain't really trying to, you know, just use the U.S. dollar in your own country and we'll do what we want to do in our country. We do that already. We ain't forcing nobody to settle in the U.S. dollar. <laughs> people are settling in the U.S. dollar because they don't trust their own country's currency. That ain't got nothing to do with us. Your country raggedy your financial system in your country raggedy it's just raggedy it ain't got nothing to do with me it ain't got nothing to do with the united states oh yes it does the united states has been undermining our better listen i'm not gonna get into all of that all i'm gonna tell you guys is if you got your assets in u.s dollars you want to protect the dollar that's all that's my whole point i'm not gonna try to get into political or any of that kind of stuff because i don't get into that above my pay grade all i'm telling you is if your assets are in u.s dollars you might want to think about what's happening right now. You might want to start doing a little research. You might want to go to the Trillion Dollar Research Lab and type in BRICS and start doing some research. These people are, they're trying to devalue the U.S. dollar. I just read you a little excerpt from the article right here. They're trying to devalue it. They're trying to destroy it, basically. Not even devalue it. They're trying to destroy it. They're trying to destroy it. Those five countries I just mentioned who started this thing, Couple of them in there really don't like the United States. And I think y'all know which ones that is. Couple big boys in there don't like the United States, really don't like them. Couple big boys. And it's led by them. So all I'm telling you is, 
I don't have a problem with alternate payment forms or alternate payment systems. I have a problem, though, when you're saying that payment system is going to do away with the dollar. That's what I got a problem with. You may not have a problem with it, but I do. Right. I have a problem with countries saying we want to do away with the dollar. We do not want the Western influence. And that's fine, guys. Who cares? I live in America. If you live in some other country and you don't want to have no influence by the United States, then don't don't take our don't, don't settle in our currency. I don't know if anybody's forcing you to. The problem is other countries that you do business with, they want to settle in our dollar. Even within your country, you're doing business with other companies. They want to settle in our dollar. Why? Because a lot of these countries, their their their, their currency is volatile, and a lot of these a lot of these countries are 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 prone to having their governments overthrown. Just telling you. So they ain't as stable as the United States. That's why the, the, the dollar is the world's currency because we're stable. We have the number one economy in the world. We got the number one financial system in the world. We do. Matter of fact, I think we got more billionaires than anybody else in the world. I'm talking about single country. That might be arguable, but... I think we do. So my point is, pay attention to what's going on here, guys. Don't bury your head in the sand. Pay attention to what's going on in this world. Don't just get caught up in your world thinking nothing else matters, but pay attention. Pay attention. There are threats to the U.S. dollar out there. I keep telling you, in my opinion, crypto is a threat to it as well. Because the more value crypto builds up, the more the dollar goes down. That, that's my opinion, guys. Y'all go out and do your own research and, and, and figure it out for yourself. But I'm just telling you, that's my opinion. Be on the lookout for what's going on with the dollar. There's a, there's a, there's a threat to our way of life here in the United States. And that threat is being attacked through the dollar. So ain't nobody going to try to do nothing military against us. They know better than that. So what they do is they're going to come after the dollar. They're going to do everything they can to devalue the dollar. Because if they can, if they can, if they can, if they can mess up our financial system, then they got us. They got us. See, that's our stronghold. That, that's our, that's our, that's the thing we hang our hat on is our financial system being so strong and, and, and we being the, the world's reserve currency. Because we, we, we have a lot of allegiance to us because of that. If you destroy the dollar, a lot of these countries have no allegiance to us. They'll turn on us. And if you can get them to turn on us, now it's just us against the world. And that's not what we want. Right. We want to make sure we keep the dollar strong. So if you live here in America, support keeping the dollar strong. That, that would be my ask of you, my recommendation. Support keeping the dollar strong. And if other countries don't want to trade in the dollar, don't. It's pretty simple, guys. Don't transact business in the dollar. Use your currency. If you want to support this other currency out there, go ahead. Don't transact business in the dollar. But us living in this country, I'm not sure why we wouldn't support the dollar if we live here. <laughs> That's the part I'm kind of confused on. If we live here, why wouldn't we support the dollar? I don't know. Y'all, y'all, y'all have to figure that when I, I've given you my little two cents. Uh, I'm going to continue to support the dollar. I'm going to continue to buy assets that support the dollar. Uh, and I'm going to continue to use the dollar as my payment source as long as I'm able to. I'm just going to continue to do that. I live in America and I want to see America prosper. I want to see American way of life continue to be the best in the world. So I'm going to do my part to try to support that. Again, it's not that we're perfect. We're not. We're not perfect. But I don't know if there's another country in this world I'd want to live in other than the U.S. Just based on the opportunity that I have here. I mean, I can I have the opportunity to do pretty much whatever I want to do when it comes to my financial life, man. I get to build a business if I want to without any interference from anybody. I get to buy paper assets. I get to buy real estate in any community I want to buy it in. I, 
get to live a lifestyle that I want to live without having to worry about somebody stepping in and saying, no, you can't live that life. I, I, I don't have any, I get every opportunity here in America. That's why I keep telling you guys, it's important that you build assets. See, when you build assets and you got assets that generate income, it opens a whole nother world to you. Because now you don't have to be beholden to anybody. You can do your own thing within the law, of course. All I'm saying is support that. Support the U.S. dollar. Because if this thing cr crumbles, we're going to be in trouble. And ain't nobody in the world going to feel sorry for us. I'm just to let you know that. Oh, they're going to come to our aid. They're going to help us out. No, they ain't. They're going to step on our throat. That's what they're going to do. All your big boy countries, all of them. None of them going to come to our aid. Maybe Canada. But ain't none of the rest of them. They're going to turn on us. So support the dollar. Support the dollar. Let's move on and let's talk about this debt problem we have in this country, which uh, doesn't, help our, don't, doesn't help us when it comes to our dollar, right? All of this debt doesn't help us. But let, let, let's talk about it. Here's the headline. $167,911,000,000 added to the U.S. national debt in 20 days. Now, y'all know we got to stop this. See, we just on ahead just talking about keeping the dollar strong. And here we go out here. We spend it like ain't no tomorrow. I mean, gee, Monetti, how do you add almost $168 billion to your deficit in 20 days? That is absolutely insane. $168 billion added to your U.S. national debt in 20 days as Citadel CEO warns government spending at borderline insanity. This is one of your big boy uh, Wall Street firms stepping in and, 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 and giving his little two cents. The CEO of a $60 billion hedge fund says Americans should be alarmed about the country's rapidly expanding debt. Now numbers from the Treasury Department show the national debt climbed from 34, tri $34 trillion 393 billion on March 1st to 34 trillion 561 billion on March 20th, a rise of 168 billion in just 20 days, guys. <laughs> we out of control with the spending, man. At this point, the rapid pace of the country's debt accumulation poses a major risk to America's fiscal future according to Citadel CEO Kevin Griffin. In a, in, a new, in, in a new CNBC interview at the International Futures Industry Conference in Florida, Griffin says the lack of daily dialogue among the growing national debt is allowing the government to borrow at a rate that's irrational and dangerous. Griffin says no outside entity can or will save the United States from a debt crisis. Wow. I think the biggest issue that's not priced in the markets right now is the sovereign risk of U.S. credit. It's not AAA anymore. I wish it were AAA. I think it's just not part of the day in and day out dialogue. And that allows Washington to continue to spend at levels that are borderline insanity at the point in the economic cycle. We're talking about a budget next year of $7 trillion. Here's the problem, though. <laughs> the budget is $7 trillion. The problem is we're not going to collect that much in taxes. So where are you going to get the shortfall from? We're probably only going to collect maybe $4 trillion in taxes. So you're going to have a $3 trillion shortfall. Where do you think we get that from? We're talking about a budget next year of $7 trillion. Spending is, a, spending is up about 20% in two years. This is just out of control. And unfortunately, when your sovereign markets start to put the hammer down in terms of discipline, that could be pretty brutal. There's no country that's going to bail America out. You got that right. You're going to right our own ship. There's no IMF for the United States of America. Wow. Those are some pretty impactful words from one of your 
Wall Street firms about the United States national debt. Here's the deal, guys. We're operating the United States as a company. Just think about the United States as a company, right? You got $4 trillion in income, top line income, $4 trillion. You got $4 trillion in income. But you got what? $7 trillion in expenses. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if I got $4 trillion in income, but I got $7 trillion in expenses, I'm negative $3 trillion. I got to get that $3 trillion from somewhere. Where do I get it from? Where do I get the $3 trillion from, chat? Who gives us the $3 trillion? Where does America go to get the $3 trillion from, chat? What happens? Oh, that's where the Federal Reserve would come in, right? That's where you and I would come in, right? So what happens is you got America over here with $4 trillion in income. And what's the, where, do, where does our income come from, chat? Where does the, the income to run our government comes from? What is that income? What is it called? What is that income called? Somebody in the chat help me out here. What is that income called that the federal government collects from its people? It's called taxes, guys. The federal government collects taxes from its citizens or the people who live here, right? If you live here, you got a job, you're making wages, they want part of it. So they collect taxes from people that live here in the United States. They collect all these taxes. Problem is, they're only gonna collect about $4 trillion worth. But yet it's still over here, we got expenses. That's Social Security, right? We got all these government programs. We got all kind of little sweetheart deals, we giving people money for all kind of crap, right? So we got $7 trillion in expenses, right? We got to pay your senators. We got to pay your congressmen, your, your, your House of Representative folks. Got to pay your president. I think he'd make about 500000 something like that. Got to pay him. Got to pay all the cabinet. Got to pay all the government employees. Got to pay a lot of people. Got to fix roads, right? We got to do that. We got to fund the military. Why? Because we got to have a military force so that people are going to try to hit us over the head with a hammer. We got to have military. Got to be the best military in the world, which I'm glad we do got the best military in the world. So we got some expenses to pay for it. Problem is, we ain't got enough income coming in. So where do we go to get that income, guys? Somebody in the chat tell me, where do we get this $3 trillion from to, to balance the budget, to, to make all this work? Where do we get the $3 trillion from? Well, the three trillion is going to come from the United States government taking out debt. That's where our U.S. debt continues to escalate, guys. In order to cover that three trillion dollar shortfall, we go take debt out. We go get a loan. Just like you and me. You know how we do. We ain't got enough money. We go get us a loan to go buy stuff we don't need. Yeah, we do the same thing here in the country. Same thing. Same thing. Right. Just like you and I. We got an income, we spend all that income, we run out of money, but we got more bills. You know how we run out of money? We got this money over here, but we got more bills than we got money. We got more bills, expenses, than we got income? You know how a lot of us run our, we run our, we run our budget just like the United States government run their budget, in a deficit. Most people live paycheck to paycheck in this country. But our country lives paycheck to paycheck. So the country live paycheck to paycheck, the people live paycheck to paycheck, other than the 1%, other than the 1%. The government and the 99% live paycheck to paycheck. Our government is living paycheck to paycheck. Our government, if it was a business, a traditional business, a private business, would probably have to file for bankruptcy. It probably would. It's operating in the red, but not necessarily because they have the ability to go out and get debt. And that's where this $34 trillion comes in, guys, because we go out and we borrow money from people like you and I, we borrow money with the Fed, we, other, other countries. Remember, guys, Japan, I think Japan, we owe Japan like 
I think 1.7 billion, 1.7 trillion, something like that. I think we owe, let me see what we owe Japan. Let me look it up real quick in a, in, in, in a $1 trillion research lab. What countries, what countries holds U.S. debt? Now let's see. There we go. So what countries owe, here we go. So we got $7.6 trillion, guys, of that $34 trillion. 7.6 trillion of the 34 trillion we borrowed from other countries. We borrowed that money. They, they took out debt, right? In the form of US securities, right? Treasury bonds, treasury bills, treasury notes, those types of US securities, right? So we got Japan and mainland China so you got Japan and mainland China holding a lot of that $7.6 trillion in debt. Guys, it's not good. That's not good. Looks like we're going to have to go get some more debt this year for 2024. It, it appears we're going to have to get some more debt for 2024. It appears that way. So, so it's a problem because it continues to grow. See, anytime you have more expenses, then you have what? Income. You got a deficit. And like I said, any other country, I'm sorry, any other company in the United States would probably be in bankruptcy proceedings right now. But, but, but with America, we have the ability to borrow money through our U.S. securities, treasury bonds, treasury notes, right? Treasury bills. We have the ability to borrow money unlimitedly, right? We, we, we tap it, we, we, we knock on the door at the, 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 the Federal Reserve, they open up the piggy bank. They turn on the money printer, right? Boom, we got three trill. We need three trill. That's what happens. Problem is, this debt is continuing to escalate every year. There's another three trillion going to be added to it. I already told, they already told you here in the first 20 days of March, we added 168 billion to the deficit in 20 days. Guys, we're on a pace. I think I read something that they said we were on a pace by the year 2030 or 2034, I think they said. Either 2030 or 2034, we'll be at about $45 trillion national deficit. 45 trillion. When does it end, guys? When does it end? When does it end? When do we right size this? Or can we just continue to kick the can down the road in perpetuity? I don't think we can. And I think that's what this guy, this, this Wall Street CEO from this huge hedge fund, $60 billion hedge fund, is saying that at some point, it don't catch up to you till it catch up to you. It's, 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 it's insanity. It's insane. It's insane. U.S. debt. U.S. debt. In the future. Let's look at the, what, what, what the million, what the trillion dollar research lab says about U.S. debt. Here we go. Here we go. Check this out, guys. Check this out. Federal debt forecast, U.S. 2000. 34, the U.S. federal debt forecast for fiscal year 2023 to 2034. By 2034, the gross federal debt of the United States is to be projected about $54.39 trillion. This would be an increase of around $21 trillion U.S. dollars in the next 10 years. Almost double. Almost double, guys. If, if you're not alarmed by that, you should be. If you're not terrified by that, you should be. 
See, when we run around here worried about who we're going to elect and all this other stuff, all of them always say what? What do they always say? We're going to fix the deficit. We're going to right size it. I don't care who we vote for. They always say their group is going to come in and do something. But what happens, though? <laughs> Every time you put one of them in the White House, what they do? It, the debt keep going up. It just keep going up. These people are predicting by the year 2034, we're going to have almost $55 trillion. $55 trillion in debt, guys. The United States. And I would probably say right now, we already got $7.6 trillion to, 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 to outside countries. So we got to do something. What, what, what should we do? How do we, how, how, how do we get out of this mess? Stop spending money on stuff you don't need to spend it on. That's how you get out of it. That's all. Stop making sweetheart deals. That's all. That's all. Stop giving, stop giving millions and millions and billions of dollars to, to stuff we shouldn't be giving it to. Right? One of the things you're going to see happen here, guys, for some of you folks who, who, who are dependent on your Social Security, you, you do know they're trying to push the age limit back. They ain't trying to give you no money at 62 no more. They're trying to push that thing back. They're saying, oh, no, these people living too long. <laughs> they're living too long. We can't give it to them at 62 no more. Uh-uh. Uh, 67. 70, 70 years old. Let's push it back to 70. They're living too long. See, that's, that's the thing, though, guys. That's why I keep telling y'all, don't hang your hat on Social Security because we live too long. And Social Security was never set up to take care of you for, the, for, 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 for 40 more years of your <laughs> for 30 more years of your life. It was never set up for that. It was set up, okay, back then when they set it up, people, would, people were dead at like 55 years old, 60 years old. You know, people would, that was the end of life back then. Now people are living to... Yeah, I think for men, y'all help me out here in the chat, but I think for men, the average life spent, let me look that up on the, the trillion dollar research lab. What's the, what's the average lifespan for a man? What is the average lifespan for a man? 73.5 years, guys. That's for a man. 73.5. And for a woman, it's 79.3 years. So for a woman, it's almost 80 years old. For a man, it's almost 75. Let's see what it was back in the 50s. Just trying to make a point here, guys. I'm just telling you, you depend on this stuff. It won't be there for you. You better build some assets. What was the average lifespan for a man and woman in the 1950s? So here it is. Life expectancy grew from 66.5 years for a man to 71.4 and 71 for a woman in the 1950s. So for a man, it was around 66. Now it's almost 75. For a woman, it went from 71 all the way to 80. So now people are living basically on, on, on average 10 more years. Social Security can't keep up with that. Guess what they're saying though? We're going to push that age back. We can't pay y'all at 62 no more. You got to get to 70. You got to get to 68, whatever they push it back to, but they're going to push it back from 62. So some of y'all who are saying, oh golly, I'm, I'm 59. All I got is three more years. Boy, they're going to move. They're going to move. They're going to move the cheese on you. They're going to move the cheese. You think the cheese over here at 62, they're going to move that cheese. They're going to be 70. And then you're going to be like, oh, what the world am I? I got to work for another however many years. That's why I tell you guys, you, you, you got to build wealth. You got to build wealth. We don't know how our government is going to run our country when it comes to the fiscal end of it. What we can do is, is make sure the people we're electing have a focus on reducing the national debt. The problem is the 1% runs the country. 
and I'm gonna just give it to you clean. The 1% runs the country and the 1% don't want the debt paid down. Now, I know what this guy on this hedge fund guy, I don't trust him. I don't believe nothing he say. He a hedge fund guy out of Wall Street, so I don't believe nothing he say, <laughs> period. 1% don't want the deficit to come down. They don't. The 1% like it the way it is. Why? Because the 1% run the government, guys. So if the 1% wanted it down, they run the government, they would bring it down. They don't want it down. They know the 99% are the ones that suffer when the debt is up. When, the debt, when our national debt is where it's at and where it's going, only people that suffer is the 99%. 1% don't suffer. These people got assets, man. They run the government. They run our educational system. They run our mainstream media. They run our financial system. So if they wanted to decrease it, they would. You and I don't have no control over that. We don't. What control we have? We can't even budget. We can't even balance our own checkbook. So you know we can't do nothing. We can't even balance our own checkbook. So if the 1% wanted to bring down the national debt, they would. But they don't. I wonder why. Ah. Oh. They don't have any financial interest in bringing it down. That's how they make money. They want it sky high. They do. That's my opinion. You may disagree. So the only way we can help and do our part, guess how we do our part? We concentrate on our own high interest rate credit card debt. Let's, let's get ourselves out of high interest rate credit card debt. Let's get our own selves out of student loan debt. Let's get our own selves out of this high interest rate car loan debt. Let's get ourselves out of all this debt we're in personally. And then I think we start slowly but surely fixing the debt problem in this country. We will. A big part of that, a big part of the, the government, they take certain amounts of money and they allocate to things that go wrong in our country. Think about bankruptcies. Think about these major banks that fail. Now, I'm not saying that's our fault that they fail, but I'm just saying a lot of this money goes to programs that are in place because as, a, as, a, as, a, as Americans, our financial situation for a lot of us is not real good. So unemployment, things like that, all this kind of stuff Again, I know we pay payroll taxes and we pay all kind of stuff for Social Security. We do. And, and, and I know that. But here's the thing. Clearly, as a country, we're just not a, we're not efficient. But when you look at the American people, we're not efficient either. So we're not efficient when our financial resources, nor is our government efficient. So as a person who is trying to build wealth, the number one thing I can do is just get efficient. I got to get myself financially efficient to the point where I'm living on less than what I make. I'm living on a plan, which is a financial budget. I know exactly how much money's coming in. I know exactly what's going out. I got to stay out of consumer debt. And then I got to save and invest. I got to do those four things, guys. I was speaking with a gentleman this morning on a one-on-one -on -one call that I had with him at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Eastern time. And he and I was talking about his financial situation. And, and that's exactly what I told him. He was doing good. He had, you know, he's, he's, he had some financial bumps. He overcame those bumps. He's gotten himself back on the right track financially. Now he's starting to build again and think about his future and, and building wealth. And I told him the same thing I'm telling you guys. It all starts with those four financial principles. You got to live on less than what you make. You got to live on a plan. You got to stay out of consumer debt. You got to save and invest. If you do those four simple things, and I call them simple because once you get your mindset right, they are simple. But if your mindset ain't right, they're going to they're gonna seem hard. He and I talked about side hustles. I told him, just like I tell you guys every day, you got to have multiple streams of income, guys. All of us are good at something. 
All of us have hobbies that we do that we do not monetize. Start monetizing some of those hobbies that you have. This gentleman, he had four, he had about four dip really good things that he enjoyed doing when he, he wasn't working. Four really good things. And I said, listen, man, you got four things you just told me that you're really good at and you enjoy doing. Monetize them. Well, what are we doing here? Monetize one or two of these things. You're doing them anyways. You love doing them. You're good at it. Monetize them. And I talked to him about a few ways to monetize them, right? So my point here is, guys, all of us have to do our part if we want to get this national debt down. It ain't just the government fault. Now, the 1% don't want it down, but forget what they want. We, as the people, have the ability to help bring this deficit down. If we want a better tomorrow for our children than we have today, we got to help bring this deficit down. How do we help? Let's take care of our own financial deficit. Let's take our own little financial deficit and right size it. Let's stop buying things we don't need. Let's do that. Let's get out of this credit card debt. Let's get out of this car loan debt. Let's get out of this student loan debt. Let's do our part. And I promise you, if we do our part, this deficit will start coming down. 1% ain't going to want it to come down. But if we do our part, it will come down. It'll come down if we do our part. But if we don't do our part and we continue to have a raggedy relationship with money, then guess what? This, this debt is going to continue to escalate. 1% don't care because they got assets. 1% love it. They want, the, they want the United States government to have to borrow money because they're the ones who are lending it to them. Y'all don't know that? Oh, yeah. All this activity you see in these treasury bonds, these treasury bills, these treasury notes. Oh, yeah. Those are Wall Street firms. Those are, those are big time investors. That ain't really, really the, one, the 99%. That's the 1% manipulating all that. So the more they got us in debt as a country, the more they money they make. Hell, if I can get me a 4.5% rate on, you know, $25 million. If I can get me a 4.5% rate on $20 million over, four year, over two years and it's guaranteed money, why not do it? So all I'm telling you is we can help bring this deficit down, but it's going to take all of us. And when we got to start with our own personal situation at home, we got to get ourselves out of debt. If you think about it this way, if you were your own your own company, would you be would you be operating at a profit or a negative right now? If you were your own company, just take your personal situation and say, well, OK, here's my income coming in. Here's my expenses going out. Do I got more expenses going out than I got income coming in? If you do, then you're operating at a negative. You're not, you're not fiscally responsible for your own individual company. You're operating at a negative. You have a negative net profit. Now, if I got more income, then I got expenses going out and I got money left over, then I'm operating in the, in, 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 in the, in the positive. I got positive net income. I'm doing great. I can take that positive and put it in assets to multiply it. And I do even greater. So even though our country is, in my opinion, running at a deficit, we don't have to run at a deficit. And collectively, if we all decide not to run at a deficit, then guess what? Ultimately, our country starts bringing this debt, debt, debt down. But if we don't do that, we're going to be in a world of trouble. You already see what they're saying by 2034. This thing about to double. This thing at 34 trillion right now. They're talking about this thing going to be 55 trillion. Better do something, guys. Oh, I don't want my taxes to go up. Reduce the debt then. Your taxes may not go up. You don't reduce the debt. Your taxes going up. They got to collect more taxes from you. They got to get it from somewhere. They ain't going to get it from the 1%. I know Joe Biden think he, oh, I'm going to go up to the 1%. Man, Joe, Joe just talking. Joe, Joe can't mess with them people. They put him in the office. So how he gonna tax them? That's just a smoke screen. Who they gonna tax is you and me. You can be, pay attention if you would. That's a smoke screen. Them people ain't finna pay no tax. I already told you billionaires pay what? 8%. That's their average tax they pay. Billionaires. 
8%. Think about how much taxes you pay. If you somebody out there working, think about how much taxes you pay. But you got billionaires pay less than 8%. I know in my business, I pay more than 8%. Billionaires pay 8% on average. Billionaires. Think about your situation. How much you pay? I had a, I had a guy email me the other day. Man, I'm paying $10,000, $15,000 a, uh, uh, a year in, uh, uh, on my taxes. I got to pay the government ten dollars to $15,000. And this gentleman wasn't making no large amount of money. I think he was in that, you know, maybe been in that 100 range. So he's still paying. If you know, if you make $100,000 a year, guys, and you're paying Uncle Sam ten dollars to $15,000, you, you, you... Percentage-wise, you're paying more than a billionaire. So who do you think they work for, me or you? Who do you think them people in Washington, D.C. work for? Me or me and you or the 1%? Now, how are you a billionaire and you pay 8% in taxes? I'm not a billionaire and I pay more than you in taxes percentage-wise to my income. Now, I know people are going to say, well, dollar amount-wise, they pay more. Well, they should. <laughs> they be, you don't got a billion dollars. I mean, wouldn't you think he'd pay a little more? I'm sure he'd done fleece somebody along the way. Not all of them, but yeah, come on, guys. You got a billion dollars. You, you ain't been no, you, you ain't been, uh, trust me, you ain't been Mother Teresa the whole time if you got a billion dollars. You done, you, done, you done stepped on somebody. I mean, come on now. I don't know no billionaire who ain't shrewd. Come on now. Y'all, let's be in the real world here. You got a billion dollars, you done stepped on somebody. Yes, you have. Come on now. Let's not get it twisted here. You got a billion dollars. You done stepped on somebody. All I'm telling you is these cats pay 8% on average. You and I pay more than that on average. I'm just telling you. Especially if you're W-2. Because I told you. You W-2 folks out there, the government get paid first. And you get paid second. If you're W-2, because they take your taxes off right off the rip before you get anything. Taxes come out. Boop. You don't even get to give me them taxes. Now, if you're a business owner, you get paid first. You pay taxes second. If you're a W-2 guy or gal, government get paid first. You get paid second. That's how it work. That's why I keep telling y'all business owners have more better treatment in our current tax structure. The way our IRS works business owners have better treatment than W-2 folks. All I'm telling you is this. If you want taxes to come down, get yourself your house in order financially. If we all collectively do that, I think we help bring down this, this deficit. Because whether we like it or not, guys, the government does spend money on some of us. Some of us got ragged relationship with money. Some of us need a little bit of assistance. Some of us need a little helping hand financially. And let's face it, the government do step in and give, some, give a helping hand. There's a lot of programs out there for people who need a helping hand. And I'm not against that. I'm just telling you, let's, let's be honest here. As Americans, some of us need a financial helping hand and the government does step in and help. So a part of that deficit is on us, right? The bigger part of the deficit is on the 1%. But a smaller part of that deficit is on us. So we got to right size our financial life. And that will help, in my opinion, it'll help us do our part to help bring that thing down. That's what I believe. You have to figure that one out. Last thing we're going to cover, guys, is I want to talk to y'all about one of these, uh, these banks, these big boy banks. Got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, right? Um, and um, had to pay out. A, a nice little chunk of money. Let, 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 let's, 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 let's read through it. Here's the headline. J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and six financial giants paid $70 million settlement over allegations of widespread fraud and collusion. <laughs> I try to tell y'all guys, man, these folks will run over your butt and then do what? back up and run over you again and then go forward and run over you for the third time. I'm telling you, they will run over you three times if you don't watch them. That's the headline. 
Eight financial giants are shelling out tons of millions of dollars to settle a decade-long whistleblower lawsuit. J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Fifth Third Bank Corp, Barclays, Bank of Montreal, and William Blair were sued in 2014, accused of reaping millions in illicit profits by rigging interest rates on municipal bonds. <laughs> Boy, these people something else, right? The whistleblower identified in the lawsuit as Edelweiss Fund LLC says the firms have paid $70 million to settle the lawsuit. Edelweiss accused the group of Wall Street firms of widespread fraud and collusion after the state of Illinois hired them to market municipal bonds known as variable rate demand obligations at the lowest possible interest rates. VRDOs are tax-exempt bonds issued by municipalities to get long-term financing, usually spanning 20 to 30 years. But instead of marketing the bonds at low interest rates, the banks allegedly inflated the rates to generate millions of dollars in fees and discouraged investors from converting the debt securities to cash. <laughs> I told y'all guys, these banks, especially the big boys, they ruthless, man. They ruthless. Now, they're necessary evil. I agree. They are a necessary evil, but you got to watch them. So I tell y'all, y'all go in there, I'm going to sit down with my financial advisor and they're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them carte blanche. They can put it in whatever they want to. I trust them with my life. Okay. You see what's happening with these big boy banks. I'm telling you, you better watch yourself. You better watch yourself. You better watch these banks. You better know who you're dealing with. You better, you, be, you, you better know who you're dealing with. <laughs> with the settlement finalized and executed, the state of Illinois is set to collect $33.6 million while Edelweiss principal Johan Rosenberg will receive $14.4 million as a reward for bringing the lawsuit on behalf of the government. Now this cat, he gonna get $14 million just for bringing the lawsuit to fruition. <laughs> Boy, this is crazy. The, rate, the remaining $22 million will be set aside to pay for legal expenses incurred by Edelweiss through the years. Only thing I'm telling you guys is be careful, man. These big boy too big to fail banks, man. Just, just be careful with financial institutions. I don't care if they're Wall Street. Well, they're all Wall Street, right? But I'm talking about banks, investment firms, uh, insurance companies, Here's another, here's another one that has been one that I've, I've struggled with for years and, and, and people just continue to fall into the trap. This whole whole life insurance thing. That's another big one, guys. And it plagues our, our community, right? They prey on people who don't know much about insurance and, 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 and they try to convince them uh, through some, some crazy manipulation tactics that whole life insurance is a good investment. They pitch it as an investment. Guys, there's a time and place for whole life insurance, but I, I wouldn't call it an investment. I, I wouldn't call it an investment. It's not going to outperform an S&P 500. It's not. Oh, you just build up this money in here. You never pay taxes on it. Uh, listen, guys, please be careful when you're listening to these insurance companies, these banks. Be careful. Just be careful. Educate yourself. They do not have your best interest at heart. These people eat what they kill, a lot of. Now, I'm not saying every insurance agent is bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you, if somebody is coming to you with something and they all they want to push is one type of life insurance and they don't give you all the choices and let you choose and give you the, the do's and don'ts and the pros and cons of both, there's a reason. If somebody only comes to you and only wants to talk about whole life insurance, but they don't want to talk about term life insurance at all, there's a reason. You got to just think through this. Hey, why not talk about term life? Why you only want to talk about whole life? See what I'm saying? Be careful. If I go into a bank 
And all they want to talk about is getting me a loan, a high interest rate loan. But they have no information in there how I get out of debt. Only information they have is how to get in debt. <laughs> There's a problem with that. See, so if you walk in your bank, they should be counselors. They should look at your situation and say, well, hey, let's help you. We got some programs to help you get out of this debt before you get into more debt. They're not going to give you that information, though. They're going to give you information on how to get in more debt because that's the business they're in. Same with insurance companies. They're not going to give you any information where it's going to take money out of their pocket. See, whole life policies put money, a lot of money in their pocket because they collect a lot of fees. Term life insurance, very little fees. But they serve the same purpose. It's a death benefit. It should never be an investment vehicle, in my opinion. Insurance should never be an investment vehicle. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it protects your loved ones in the event your, the income stream you generate disappears. Insur life insurance protects your loved ones so that they have a stream of income that they can continue to live their life if something were to happen to you. It was never intended to be an investment vehicle. But we've turned it into that. Why? Because we can charge more fees. We can fleece the American public, the American people more. That's what they've turned it into. That's what the banks have turned into. They take our deposits. They lend our deposits out. They invest our deposits in all kind of crap. They don't really give us none of the profit. They'll give us nothing. If they can get away with it, they won't even pay you anything. You know your big boy banks ain't paying nothing on money markets. Now, these little banks online, these little small banks in the town you live in might play, pay you a little bit. Because they have to. They got no other way to make money other than use your deposit to make loans. My point in telling you this is, guys, you got to be careful these people you're listening to. And again, I'm not saying all people that work in banks are bad. I'm not saying all insurance agents are bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you their industry as a whole is bad. <laughs> Every person in the industry ain't bad. But the industry itself, they don't care nothing about you. Why? Because they control by the 1%. I keep telling you all this. Every insurance company, big boy insurance company, is controlled by the 1% or shareholders. And I'm not talking about just little bitty shareholders like you and me. I'm talking about big boy shareholders who have millions of shares. Not, oh, I got me a fractional share of Apple. I'm going to the, I'm going to the annual meeting with my half a, half a share of Apple. No, they're not going to let you in the meeting. Only people get in those meetings, they have millions and millions of shares. Right? Those are one percenters. All I'm telling you is the industries are crooked. Be careful when you walk into a bank. Be careful when someone is pitching you whole life insurance, but they're not telling you what other options you have. That's a red flag, guys. I get people all the time ask me about insurance, and I'm telling them, guys, I'm not an insurance agent, but if I'm an investor, I can put my money in something way better than a whole life policy to get a way better return. And this notion of, oh, you never pay taxes on it. That's, listen, guys, the IRS ain't no dummy. They're not stupid. They're not stupid. The IRS is not stupid. So you let these little insurance agents who just got their little insurance license trick you into something, you get tricked into it. Now, it's one thing if you say, hey, you know, I got a $10 million estate and I really want that whole $10 million to pass on to my kids and I don't want no estate taxes to take half of it. So guess what? I'm going to buy this whole life policy and I'm just going to fund it to the basics so that I can get this $5 million death benefit. If I pass on my guys, my kids can take that $5 million death benefit and pay the estate taxes and then they get the full 10 million. See, that's how rich people use whole life insurance. They don't use it. Well, it's going to be my retirement fund. They don't use it that way. But see, that's why they come to us and prey on the 99% because of our lack of financial knowledge. They prey on us. They don't go to the 1% with that crap. It's an estate planning tool for the 1%. For us, they want us to think it's the retirement fund. It's just stupid, but we got to be prepared for these kind of people who try to come into our lives with this, with this wrong information. I keep telling y'all the 99% makes all this thing work in this country. Whoever controls the 99% gets rich. That's the way it is. 
Whoever controls the 99%, they get rich. Insurance companies know that. Banks know that. Big, big, uh, big, uh, big car companies know that. Everybody knows that, except the 99%. We're the only one don't know that. We in some la-la land. Like, we don't know. No, they use us to build their wealth and keep their wealth. We have to know that and reverse engineer on them and build our own wealth. So just be careful out there. I went through and gave you guys my, oh, one last thing, one last thing, and then we out of here. I promise. I told you I was going to give you a daily dose of crypto, but a positive daily dose of crypto today. So hopefully I get some thumbs up from you crypto guys. Give me a thumbs up, crypto guys. I'm giving you a daily dose, a good daily dose of crypto. <laughs> give me a thumbs up, crypto guys, because I know y'all haven't been liking me these last few weeks. So give me a thumbs up, crypto guys, if you appreciate this content I'm finna give you, and then we're going to get out of here. Headline, Bitcoin and Ethereum see 3% gains as having looms. After sinking as low as 63,000 over the weekend, Bitcoin has rebounded and posted a 3% gain in the past day. After sinking very low, Bitcoin rebounded. At the time of writing this article, the Bitcoin price is 66000 964, despite its 2.5% dip over the past week. BTC has still managed to surge 31% in the past month thanks to bullish momentum from traders. There's now less than a month left before the next Bitcoin halving. That's basically where they're going to create more Bitcoin. And I know y'all will disagree with that, some of y'all. There's not creating more. This is going to be. They create more. That's my opinion. They just create more. They're going to keep doing that too, by the way. But I digress because this is a positive, this is a positive daily dose of crypto. So I'm not going to go negative. I promise you, I'm not going negative today on Bitcoin. It's a positive day for Bitcoin. There's now less than a month left before the next Bitcoin halving, which will see the reward paid to miners cut from 6.25 to 3.125 BTC. At the time of writing, it looks like it will occur on April 19th, according to Nice Hash. But the next, but the but the exact date changes all the time. That's because halvings occur every 210,000 blocks and aren't scheduled to happen on exact calendar days. And although new blocks tend to take 10 minutes to be processed, it varies. Over the past week, the Bitcoin price has been volatile. And there's reason to believe it will continue to exhibit volatility leading up to the halving. That's because investors tend to second guess whether they're appropriately priced in the halving. Ethereum, which is the next thing down from Bitcoin, is the next big boy on the block when it comes to crypto. Ethereum, on the other hand, has also exhibited positive momentum with a 2.6 gain over the last 24 hours. So what do you have, guys? You got Bitcoin trying to resurge, trying to bounce, and it's been doing pretty good. For, for you Bitcoin guys out there, you should be loving this. You should be loving this. At the time of writing, the Ethereum price is $3,452. ETH nearly slipped below $3,000 at one point last week, but has been steadily climbing since Sunday morning. Still, Ethereum has seen its price increase 17%. So Bitcoin, 31% over the last month. Ethereum, 17%. Not bad, crypto guys. Not bad. At the end of the month, at the end of last week, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission again delayed its decision on an application to convert the Grayscale Ethereum Trust into a spot Ethereum ETF. And again, guys, it's not an ETF. I know they keep calling it that, but it's not. It's a big difference. It's an E, I think it's an ETP, exchange traded product, not an exchange traded fund. It's an exchange traded product. It now has until May 30 to decide whether to approve, deny, or delay again. Now, here's the thing. And again, this was a positive spin. I don't got anything negative to say about Bitcoin today or, or Ethereum or crypto in general. 
But the reason the SEC keeps putting that off is because the United States Senate sent the SEC a letter on March 11th. And some of you guys know I went through that letter with you, the whole letter. They sent them a letter saying, pump the brakes, don't approve any more of these things. We believe they're a threat to the, the U.S. citizen. I'm just telling you, just paraphrasing it. Now, I'm not going negative on Bitcoin today or, or Ethereum or, Bit, or crypto, but that's the reason why the SEC pumped the brakes on that grayscale application because of this letter they got from the United States Senate. Matter of fact, it was two senators supporting the letter, but it came on United States Senate letterhead. So that was a problem. So, so think about that. Meanwhile, executives watching and waiting for the good news on Ethereum are trying to find a silver lining for the world's second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization. The spot Ethereum ETFs will gather more assets if they launch in December versus they launch in May. Bitwise Chief Information Officer Matt, whatever his name is on Twitter said, needs more time to digest the Bitcoin ETFs. That's your daily dose of crypto, guys. See, I didn't go negative on crypto. See, I can be biased. Well, not biased, but I can be fair. I can be fair, even though I am biased towards not using it. I can be fair. I gave you a positive daily dose of crypto. So give me a thumbs up for that. Well, guys, I appreciate you. I appreciate you rocking with your boy. Um, if you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo Moo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. You put $100 in that brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. You put $1,000 in that brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Guys, go click on that Moomoo Moo link. Open up that new Moomoo Moo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Don't delay. Act today. If you want to be a wealth, you want to get yourself on a trajectory over these next five, ten years to build yourself some real wealth, you got to need a brokerage account. Why not try Moomoo? Moo? That's the one I rock with. Plus, I'm going to send you two videos. I'm going to send you my wealth transfer blueprint video, and I'm going to send you the Moomoo Moo tutorial video I did. Both of those videos are very impactful. Send me an email. My email address is down in the description box. Let me know you opened that Moomoo Moo account, you funded it, and you want those two videos. The Wealth Transfer Blueprint video and the Moomoo Moo tutorial. And I'll send both of those to you. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, guys, please consider subscribing if you want to. And then lock it in with a thumbs up. Hit that thumbs up button for me, guys, before you get out of here. I appreciate you rocking with me this morning. We went a little bit over, but you guys know I had a lot to cover. It is Monday, so I had to start the week off right. Y'all know I'll be back here tomorrow, 1030 a.m. Eastern time with more financial topics to discuss. My job here, guys, is to give y'all what's going on in this economy we have. Give y'all what's going on with interest rates, with inflation, with the Fed, with these big boy banks, with these Wall Street firms, with the BRICS nation, you know, I got to talk about the dollar. I got to talk about our debt. So I'll be talking about all kinds of subjects, guys. If you enjoy that, lock it in with a thumbs up and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 1030 a.m. Eastern time. In the meantime and in between time, y'all keep yourself doing well. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind. You can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy. Get wealthy. And we'll catch you on the next one.